Hey everybody, today Rado runs through Gearworks, which is a neat little card-based area control game that's on Kickstarter right now. I'm going to be showing you how it works today in a two-player run-through, although before I go on, I strongly recommend you turn your subtitles onto the Klingon channel, so if I make any rules goofs, you'll know what they are. Okay, have you done so? Then, welcome to the Tinkerer's Workshop, where each player is an apprentice trying to impress the boss, the owner of the workshop, by doing the most to repair this contraption that has been brought in. At this point, only this card, this card, this card, and this card are working. All the other spaces are broken. And players are going to take turns playing cards into all the empty spaces to try to get the thing going again. Um, and as part of setup, each player starts with a hand of five gears. And they come uh, numbered one to nine. Are there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One to nine in, I think there's five different colors? I'm not quite sure. And each player, in addition to working on the one big project that everybody's contributing to, we all have our own side projects. I'm trying to make this cool motorcycle. And Jen, meanwhile, her starting hand, she's got some cards and she's trying to build a robot. All right. So we're working on the main job and also our own little side jobs. Also, as part of setup, each player gets one spark, which could use for various things, and a little card that reminds you of the rules for how you build and also what sparks can be used for and scoring at the end of the game. So uh, we're set up ready to go because in a two-player game, you've got um, four rows and four columns. If we were playing um, with more than two players, there would actually be another row here. There'd be, in addition to the A, B, C, D, there'd also be an E. So it becomes a four by five. But in a two-player game, it's a four by four. Also as part of setup, in the top left and the bottom right corner, two random cards get placed. And so we got this yellow one and this gray two and this red five and a yellow two over there. Now, I should say, what you're looking at today is a prototype. Bear that in mind. You can hit the I to go to the Kickstarter page or follow the show notes to see what the real game looks like. One thing that's really important to remember is these little colorful chips out here, those are mine. They did not come with my prototype. Normally, when you set the game up, you can see this is what it looks like. There's just a bunch of empty space, and you're supposed to just be able to eyeball, oh, okay, well, if I wanted to you know, place something in this row in this column, the card would go right about here. Jen and I found it's nice to have just like a little visual reminder of where the rows and columns are. So we just got these little plastic chips. We, we use these for a lot of games. They're very, very cool. Uh, it's um, Interestingly, if you go to the Kickstarter page, you'll see that there's, I believe, an add-on that you can get a player mat so that you won't just be playing on the table. You'll actually have a mat that actually shows you the grid. But I don't have that mat, so I'm just kind of making my own grid with these little things. I guess I could have done it just by placing a bunch of uh, face-down cards out to show all the spots we could play our cards. But anyway, so just bear that in mind the game normally doesn't have this grid although in all honesty I think that would kind of be a nice little addition to the game uh, just a punch board with just some simple little placeholder things or or heck 16 extra cards that are just blank but anyway sorry that's uh, neither here nor there let's stop talking about it let's start tinkering okay I'll be the first player and so on your turn, you are either going to play one of your gear cards to the gizmo we're trying to repair, or you're going to pass. Once you pass, you're pretty much out of the round. The game takes place over three rounds. We're going to try and repair three contraptions while building our own little secret contraptions on the side. So, um, I know to build this motorcycle, I need an A and a 4. means I need one of these little uh, motorcycle wheels, and I need a number 4. I need a little motor. So... Everything I'm doing, I have in the back of my mind trying to get, uh, trying to basically control row A and column four. Because whoever controls row A at the end of the first round gets a wheel. Whoever controls column four gets a motor. So that's something I'm trying to do. How do you control a row or column? By playing cards to that row or column. So um, I probably want to play a card somewhere along here to control row A. If I play here, hey, I'll control both um, the column I want and the row I want. But the thing is, I have to hold on to control because it can shift hands several times over the course of the game. Now, to play a card, there are some restrictions you have to bear in mind. First of all, for any of these rows, there cannot be more than one card of a given color. So, since there is already a gray card in this row, I could not play... Oh, I don't have any gray cards. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, so I've got a couple of these yellow gears. 
I cannot play this yellow three or this yellow nine to this row or this row because there's already a yellow there. So these ones I got to play in the top or the bottom row if I want to play them at all. So rows have that color restriction. Once a given color is there, you can't do it again. Columns have a restriction as well in that they have to be ascending or descending, your choice. So you can see there's these little arrows here. And there's a one. Um, right now, I could, if I had a, you know, heck, if I, let's just say arbitrarily, I, I decide to play this three right here. Uh, what would happen is that may, well, yeah, I could because I could not play it over here because again, the color restriction, but I could play it here. What would happen is I would rotate this to indicate that, okay, this column is now a descending column because it goes to one, three. Now in this space, um, I would not be able to put a two. In this space, I would not be able to put a five as an example because I have now determined that this uh, column is going in a particular direction. Uh, um, right, I mean, I could play another three here. I could play another one here. If I played the three over here instead, then this column would be an ascending column and only ones could be played in these spots. And hey, maybe I'd make a move like that. Actually, ooh. Ooh, I might make this move anyway, even though it really kind of limits the ability to get into the rest of this column. Because if I put this three here, then we can only put ones. And do I even have any ones? No, I don't. But you know what? I don't care necessarily about controlling um, you know, column one. That's not interesting to me. So I might do this because maybe Jen wants to control column one. So yeah, you know what? Of all the cards I've got, this actually works really nicely. I am going to play this yellow three here. And I have therefore made this ascending. Okay. So um, what happens is whenever you play a card successfully, you know, uh, adhering to the restrictions that you're placed under, you flip the chip the, for the row and the column in question. And I'm the green player. You can see I've got a little green on my player or my, on my um, rules reminder over here. So I flip these and point the green because I'm the green player. So green, me, controls this column and this row. And you know, I want to control that row. I didn't care about this column. I also want to control this column and I'll worry about that later. So hooray! I've already got one of the two pieces I need unless Jen takes control of this row away from me, which she might do, who knows. But anyway, so that was my turn except for one bonus. This is, there's an extra consideration. Not only are the restrictions to where you can play, but there's the opportunity to get points as well, or not points, um, because after I put a card down, I look in all directions, north, south, east, and west, for any cards that or are um, in that direction, for the first card that's in that direction. Uh, in this case, if I look south, there's a one, and if I look west, there's a two. If I, the card I placed is equal to the sum of these or the difference of these, I get another spark. And so, two plus one equals three, I just earned myself a spark. Yay! The more sparks you have, the better. They are worth points. Each spark is worth a point at the end of the game, but they're also very powerful. So that's actually really cool. Now, the same thing would have happened if I'd played over here, you know, because, hey, I've got a one and a two. One plus two equals three. Um, if I had a one card to play in this spot, that would have done it too, because two minus one equals one. So if I'd played a one or a three into this spot, I'd get a spark. Yay, I got a spark. And I've claimed this row in this column. And unless Jen's got some ones, she can't really take this row away from me now because only ones can be played in these spots. Not that I care about this row, but hey, I don't mind um, getting one of these little pieces because at the end of the game, every unused part I use is worth two points. Um, and while I don't need that little key, I might need it for a contraption I try to make later in the game. Alright, so that was my first turn. I am very happy with that. Okay, it is Jen's turn. Let's take a look at what she's got. Now, she, oh shoot, she doesn't have a 1 or a 3, so she can't place into this space to um, also get a spark. Uh, let's see, uh, 5 and 2 is, uh, you know, 3 or 7. Does Jen have a 3 or a 7? Nope, she does not. She does not have a 3 or a 7. So she won't be able to get extra sparks off of any of these things. Now, one thing I should say as well, let's say just arbitrarily that this card was actually over here and there was nothing in between. When I put this down, I still would have gotten the spark because the cards don't have to be directly adjacent. I just look um, as, uh, you know, I, I look to the north, south, east, and west until I find a card. So all the way over here, I'd still be able to compare these to score. So that's an important thing to remember too. All right, anyway, so what is Jen going to do? Well, she can't score any sparks in any of these spaces. 
But you know what? If she goes in this space right here, well, again, it's a 5 and a 2, so that's a 3. She doesn't have any 3s. And if she goes in this space, it's a 5 and a 2. She doesn't have any 3s. If she goes in this space, it's a 2 and a 1. So she doesn't have any 3s. She doesn't have any 1s. And if she goes into this space, it's a 2 and a 1. Wow. All the spaces that Jen could potentially get a spark, but she does not have any 1s, 2s, or 3s. All right. Well, but she could still start building, um, trying to set up a, uh, you know, a bonus she could get later. But what is Jen going to do? Well, first of all, she's trying to build a robot. She wants to control um, row B and column 2. So that is her goal. So she'd like to play here or here to get the parts she needs for her robot. And let's see here. Now remember, she, um, right. she cannot play any yellows in this row. She doesn't have any yellows, so she doesn't care about yellows. Where is she restricted in terms of color? All right, so she can't play this 9 in this row. And wow, OK. All right, yeah, but otherwise, I mean, because she doesn't have any grays or yellows. Uh, or, right, so this is her only restriction. She could not play this anywhere in this row. So I guess she'll go on ahead and play in this spot, because this will give her B and 2, and she hopes that she'll hold on to it. But now, what is she going to play there? Um, well, she can't um, do a number that's going to, you know, she can't play a 1 or a 3 here because she doesn't have those. Although, now, there are a lot of things you can do with your sparks. And Jen has a spark right from the get-go. Uh, let's go ahead and look at what sparks can do. Uh, first of all, you get sparks via math. As you saw, I earned a spark right off the get-go. Also, if Jen wants, she could discard two cards that aren't any use to her to get another spark. If she's got cards, maybe she can't play them because of restrictions. She can always discard two to get a spark. Now, that's, that's a bonus action she can do. It, it, on her turn, the main thing you're going to do is play a card. Now, um, let's see. <clears throat> what do sparks actually do for you? Also, in between rounds, you can potentially earn sparks. Uh, now, to use sparks, if you, use a, if you spend a single spark, you can draw another card. Or if you pass, if you decide, you know what, I'm not playing any more cards. Because any cards you don't play, you'll carry over to the next round. So you might pass. But then somebody might do something that makes you want to play a card. You can pay a spark to re-enter after you've gotten out of, of a given round, in case an opportunity comes up. Um, or you can spend a spark to draw a card. So Jen could spend this spark to draw another card and hopefully find a 3 or a 1 or one of the numbers that would let her get more sparks. Well, it's a bit of a gamble. Um, also, if you play two sparks, you can override a gear with a new gear, provided it still adheres to the rules, the restrictions, you can override somebody's gear, and then suddenly take control. Um, or you can draw a goal card so that you can have another th uh, special side project you're trying to do. So there's a lot you can do with these sparks. And Jen's thinking, well, heck, maybe she should go on ahead and spend this spark, draw another card, and maybe she'll get. But what are the chances? Eh, I, I, I don't think she necessarily is loving that. So anyway, if she's going to play here to take over B and 2, what is she going to play? Um, well... Let's see. If she played this 8, let's say. Oh, this is interesting. If she plays this 8 here, she has now really restricted this column. It started out as a 2, and it's ascending. So that means only 8s and 9s can come into these spaces now. Um, in the same way, these two spaces can only be occupied by more 1s, because it's a ascending. This is a descending. If she plays that, well, she'll, she'll take the space she wants. And now, only 8s and 9s. Now, Jen has 9s. So Jen could still go on ahead and control these if she needs to, but she's potentially locking me out unless I've got 8s or 9s as well. Uh, and now there's another thing that's going to happen also. She's put this 8 here. She doesn't make any sparks. But now you'll notice, hey, there's an 8 and a 6 right here. And so, or I'm, I'm sorry, an 8 and a 2. And she's got a 6, which on a later turn she could play over here. And then 8 minus 2 is 6, so she'd be able to get a spark on that. So that works in a couple of ways. Let's say that's what Jen's going to do. She'll play this here. Um, it, it makes this ascending. And like I said, you know, even if this 2 had originally, it's totally random. Um, she would have played this. She would have rotated this to indicate that this is now a descending column. And Jen has taken control. She is the purple player. She's going to take control of that and that. All right, it is now my turn. And I've got to decide, what am I going to do? And now that Jen has put this 8 here, she's created new opportunities. 8 minus 5 is 3. If I've got 3s, I could put them here and get more sparks. I don't have any 3s. I do have more 2s, though. Weren't there something that was, wasn't there something that was good for 2? Um, right. No, uh, this 8 now um, combines with this 5 to get, make 3s, and this 2 to make 6s. Um, 
or and I see because yeah, we don't um, ah sorry we don't go to 13 because the highest value card is nine. Oh, but there is this two one, so that would be a three, right? A two. I need a two. Uh, see, and I, you know before if Jan, no, oh yeah no 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 right. I don't think I can actually get any combinations. Maybe folks out there are shouting, yes, you can. Let's see. I don't have a six, so this, um, or, or I don't have a three. And um, yeah, so I don't have a six or a three, so I can't combine off of those. And a three or a seven, I don't have that. A six, uh, I don't have a four. Oh, I do have a, right, uh, so I, I need a six or a four to go into that space. Not, to, not you know, to get an extra spark. Let's see, and then this two and two, I don't have a four for that. I don't have a six for that, and I don't have a three for that. So I don't have anything that'll necessarily. But you know what? I could just go on ahead and keep playing cards to take control over more rows and columns. Um, right. I remember, and I still need to get a card into this column because I want to get this motor. So let's see if, if I could play in this space. Although, if I play in this space, all I'm doing is doubling down control over this. I might want to play over here because then I would take control of this row away from Jen. So this, I think, is the ideal place to play. And ideally, I'd want to put a six here, but I don't have a six. Say la vie. Now, I could, hey, I could spend both my sparks, draw two more cards, and hopefully get a six. But I still might not be able to play the six if it was a blue or a yellow six. So let's just go on ahead and play here. Now, what am I going to play? It can't be blue or yellow, so it can't be either of those because those colors are already in this row. So that means in this space, I can play this two or this nine. Hmm. All right. And again, I got to think about, hey, if I play one of these here, am I creating an opportunity for myself in this space? Like if I put this nine here, do I have a seven? No, I don't. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Let's see. Uh, you know, I think I'll just keep my options open. I'll just go on ahead and place this two here, because that's legal. Um, all right, and so since it's two, we haven't determined whether this column is ascending or descending. But I'm doing that because if Jen moves into this column, I'll still want to have the flexibility of being able to move into this column as well, because I want to make sure I control this column. So anyway, so I'll move here. I don't get any sparks because um, you know eight minus two does not equal two. Eight plus two is not equal two. Say la vie. But I have now taken control of this row away from Jen, and I now. Now have control of this column as well. And remember, that's what I wanted. I wanted a four. I've got them, and I hope I hold on to them for the rest of this round. It is now Jen's turn. It's like no. So Jen, um, unless she's willing to pay two sparks to um, override an existing card, this is Jen's last shot. She's got to play here to get this this row back. Because remember, she needs that mechanical hand for her robot. See, there it is. It's right there. She needs that mechanical hand. So, oh, 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 hold on a second, though. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Right. So, right. And so, Jen cannot play this because there's already a color here. She could play this. She can't play the, right. So, Jen's got to play one of these two into this spot to get control of this row back. And she can because of the colors. And I mean, since nothing else is here, if she plays this four, she's determined that this is a descending because it goes to four to five. That means only a four or five could go here and only a one, two, or three could go there. If she plays the nine, then it's ascending, which means only a nine could go here and um, a five, six, seven, eight, or nine could go there. So which is Jen gonna play? Well, again, if she plays here, ideally, if she could play a three or a seven or a three, um, she'd be able to get a spark. Neither of these are a three or seven. So Jen needs this because she wants that piece. She's still not making more sparks for herself. But which of these is she going to play? Bearing in mind, which is she keeping? Because this can't be played up here, but it could still be played down here. So I think, and this can't be played on this row. It could be played on that row. And in fact, oh yeah, Jen needs this because if she wants to play on this column, she needs a nine. So I think she'll hold on to that nine to be able to play on this column. She'll go on ahead and play this four. All right, and so she's playing a four here, which means this rotates around to indicate that this is a descending column. And Jen has claimed this row again, and she has claimed this column. All righty. Not that she cares about it, but hey, she'll carry this piece over to another round. Okay, so that was Jen's turn. She got, and now I can't get this row back unless I want to use two sparks to override. And I could, but you know what? I don't care about this column that much. Like I said, I mostly care about A4. I've still got those. And I've still got a few cards to play. What am I going to do now? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Right. Well, 
I could play in here to, again, double down on my dominance in this row so I don't lose A, but I've got two opportunities, and I've got two opportunities to play here. Although, interestingly, this space I cannot play because you can only play a one or a two because or no, no, actually, we could still we could still play high. That's right, because we haven't determined whether this is ascending or descending yet, because they're both twos. So I could play I could play anything here, um, and therefore hold this in place so I get that motor that I need for my motorcycle. Or I can hope Jen doesn't move in here and try to get more pieces. Or once again, I could try to go for more sparks. Let's see. So Jen just put this here. What does that create for us? Uh, four minus two is two, or a six. I don't have any twos or sixes. Um, you know, ooh, I do have a nine. If I could play a nine here, four plus uh, five plus four equals nine. But I can't do that because only a four or a five can go in this spot because this four and this five. This is now descending. So only a four or five can go here, which means we can't put a three here, um, which would, um, you know, or a seven that would play off of these. So there's no spark to be gained by playing in that space. Although I can assume Jen wants this column because she's, you know, she's played here to get it. Although for all, I don't know if Jen wants this row or this column, but if I play into this space, I'll take this column away from her and get the little, uh, you know, fuel tank. Or heck, I've got this, you know, this huge amount of stuff over here I could play in. Now I already own this row, this column. I don't own this, so it wouldn't be bad to take this away. Let's see, and let's think about where else. Okay, a six would um, do me good there. Or a three or a one. Again, I don't have sixes, threes, or ones for those spaces. I um, I don't have fours or sixes. Man, shoot. Okay, yeah. I do not have the cards I need to be able to get any more sparks at, with, the, with the current layout. But remember, I could be building to try to set myself up later for a, uh, for a sparky opportunity. Like, what would I do? Um, let's see. Well, first of all, only ones can be played in these spaces. I can't play in these spaces anyway. This is dead to me. Only nines can be played into these spaces. So maybe I should jump in on these while the jumping is good. That's not a bad idea. Right. So I could not play this nine because there's already a yellow in this row, but I could play a nine here, and then later on I could play a nine here if I still need it. What the heck? I'll go on ahead and play this nine right here. All right. So um, two, eight, nine, and now the only thing that can come here is a nine, which I've still got if I want to next turn. In the meantime, I've taken this away from Jen, and I have now claimed this. All righty, and I've still got two cards. I haven't passed yet. Now anybody can pass anytime they want, because any card you don't use, you will carry on with you into the second round. So you could have a weaker first round and a stronger second round. All right, so um, it is Jen's turn. And she, I've taken the two from her. She needs that two back. So she needs to claim this to hold on to her two. So, and it's easy peasy. She's got nines like crazy. So which nine does she place here? Well, she can't place this one because this color is already in this row. So she'll place this nine right here, thereby claiming here this row, and she took the column back. All right. Although, once again, she got no sparks. Okay. Back to me. I've still got two more cards I can play. Hmm. Let's see. Now, Jen still got two cards. I know she could come in here and take this away from me. I'm almost tempted to pass. I've got what I want. I've got this and this and this and this. I've got four pieces I'm bringing out here. I'd be pretty happy. But if I pass now, Jen might play something here and then suddenly take stuff away. That's the big disadvantage to going first. You want to be the last player in a round if you can. But, so what am I going to do in the meantime? Well, I could play this, ooh, ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to play this five right here. This is legal because there's no blues in this row and we're descending. So four, five, five, that's fine. Right, so that's a legal placement. And hey, look, nine minus four equals five. I just got myself another spark. Yeehaw, all righty, nice. And I took this from Jen and I'm holding on to this. Not that I care about this row, but I was happy to get the spark. I could use all three of these sparks right now and draw three more cards or or I could use two of those sparks right now and give myself another goal, um, which I could potentially, I mean, if I've got the right, you know what the heck, let's do it. Let's give myself another thing I'm trying to build. Um, right, I'm trying to build a motorcycle of my own. I now need, I need A and three and four. Okay, right. Hmm, let's see here. So, and I've still got one spark if I need to draw another card or whatever. Anyway, so that was my turn. 
Jen's turn. She's now down to two cards as well. And I have not taken her B or her two, which are the main things she cares about. And in fact, unless, and now Jen can see, I cannot override anymore because I don't have enough sparks. So Jen cannot lose B or two. So she could bail now. I think the only reason to keep going would be if she could get another spark. Like if she were to play this six here, um, four plus two is six, she'd get a spark. But the problem is she can't because this is descending. You could only play a one, two, three, or four here. So, um, right. And does this nine work with anything? Are there any? I mean, heck, she would have played this nine to get that spark. You know what? I think Jen's going to pass. She's done. She, um, I can't take away what she's got. She's going to save these cards for the next round. So Jen is out. It is now my turn. And hey, I've still got one more card I can play if I want to get one more thing. Is there anything I can take away from Jen? Um, you know what? Wow. I, 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 can I take away this row from her? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Um, no, I can't. I can't. This is a nine. It can go in this row because there's no yellows, but this is ascending and this is ascending. So I cannot play this in either spot uh, because uh, it's you know because they're not descending. So I can't play those. I can't spend two sparks to override something. Uh, um, and I could play it over here, but you know what? I already own this row in this column, so that's not going to do anything. So I think I'm passing as well. So we have both passed, and it is the end of the first of three rounds. And now, at the end of the round, everybody gets their rewards. Jen, she gets a mechanical hand, and she gets a Bunsen burner. She gets a torch, and let's see. And she also she gets one of these propellers. All right, so she got three things, and I got more. I get a wing and a wheel. Ah. and a key, and a fuel tank, and a motor. I'm very happy with that. I got a lot of good stuff. So now we've got all these things. If I want to use these in building a contraption to basically, right now, each one of these is worth two points at the end of the game. So basically, I just scored 10 points and Jen scored six. Uh, because she got three, I got five. But we have the opportunity now, and only now, to increase the point value of these by assigning them to our projects. So, I've, um, I've, and I'm trying to build two motorcycles. I needed an A3 and an A4. So I've got an A. I can complete one of these motorcycles. Um, hey, because I, I got the three and the four. What the heck? I'll go on ahead and use this A3, and I will show everybody, I've completed this motorcycle. Hurrah! And um, each goal, if you complete it by putting both pieces, this is nine points. So I just went from four points for these two things to nine points. And I just set this aside, face up as a reminder that I've scored these nine points. We'll, we'll reckon that at the end of the game. Now, I've still got my other motorcycle. Here's the thing. I've got a motor. I could put this on here. A half-completed project at the end of the game is worth four points instead of nine. Well, you might think, oh, that's fine. I'll just go on ahead and put this on here, and then in a future turn, I'll get the wheel and I'll score it. Here's the problem, though. When you um, work on one of your side projects, you can only work on it at that moment, and then it's done. If I put this on here now to lock in four points, it's done. A later turn, if I get a wheel, I can't add it after the fact. So I've got a kind of a push-your-luck thing going on here now. Um, I can just keep this off to the side and keep this a secret and not reveal that this is my goal. Um, and hopefully in a later turn, I'll get a wheel. And then on some later turn, I will you know, be able to score these things. But if I don't use these now, then they're just locked in at two. So do I keep this aside and hope on some future turn I get both of these? Or do I get half the points now? So it's a push your luck. Four points now or nine points later if I can get these, and this will just be worth two points instead. Because pretty much at the end of every round, you have to lock in permanently what you're doing with these pieces. <clears throat> I'm just going to lock it in now. I don't want to take the chance of maybe getting an A. Uh, so I just locked in another four points, and this is done. And so these, uh, this wing and this key, I can't use these in a the future turn for jalopies or contraptions, but hey, that's two more points I've got. So that was a very good turn for me. Jen, meanwhile, she had three objects. So she put the uh, Bunsen burner on the robot, and she put the hand. So Jen just scored nine points off of this, and only two points for that because she didn't have another um, project to work on. So this was just a two-pointer. So I definitely came out ahead at the end of the first round. Now at the end of the round, everybody takes their pieces, 
and they um, you know, uh, de deploy them however they want. And then um, everybody gets five more cards that get added. So Jen kept two cards in her hand. She gets five more. So going to the next round, since Jen played fewer cards, she passed first, she will have a bigger hand and hopefully more opportunities going into the next round. I also get five to add to my one left over. One, two, three, four, five. So there we go. So Jen has more cards than me. Also, everybody gets another project. So now I'm trying to work on a jetpack. And I'm like, oh, no! For this jetpack, I had exactly what I needed. I had the wing and the key. But I can't use them now. They've been locked in forever as just little components that the shop is going to sell. There were two points. I got to go find C1 all over again to build this secret jetpack I'm trying to build. All righty. And Jen, her new project is another robot. She's the robot queen. She needs B4 again. All right. That's her secret thing she's after. And um, we're going to start again. And uh, right. Oh, there's one more thing. Now, this is an optional thing. Um, it, you know, you could play the advanced version of the game, but by default, whoever has um, two, well, the player with two or more fewer scoring tokens and the player with the most scoring tokens gets sparks equal to the difference. So, um, Jen's got three. I've got one, two, three, four, five. So that means Jen, the difference is three. Jen gets three. This is a little kind of catch up mechanism. If there's somebody, and this would work, you know, if we were playing a four player game and the player who got the most got five and the other player only got two or three, they would get that split. So, um, this is a catch up mechanism. You can play without it if you want a more hardcore game. Um, but it's interesting, Jen, I found, we will often go out of our way to not claim rows or columns so that we can stay further back so we can get more sparks, which can really help push us forward in the next round because sparks are so powerful. Never mind the fact that they're worth points in and of themselves. Now, like I said, for people who don't like that kind of catch-up mechanism, um, although, again, you can use it as a strategy, but if you don't like it, it's an optional rule. It's not necessary. And then... Whoever is in first place, and that's me, becomes the first player in the second round. So since I'm leading, all right, oh, and we clear all this out. This contraption is done. The shop is finished with it. Oops, I bumped all my little pieces. All righty. All right. The shop has completed this thing, and now customers come in with a new contraption that needs to be worked on. So this now, once again, creates constraints for where we're supposed to build. We each now have a hand. I've got fewer cards than Jen. I'm having to go first, which also puts me at a disadvantage. Um, but uh, I've got a lot more points. Jen's got a lot of sparks. She could start using these sparks to draw more, or more importantly, more powerfully. If I get a column and I think I've got it, I, and you know it's all filled up, Jen can spend two sparks and override my card with one of her own and take it away from me. So the tug of war continues. I've got um, two things I'm trying to build. No, no, no. I locked my motorcycle in. So I'm still trying to build a jetpack. Jen's trying to build another robot. And we continue into the second of three rounds. And that, folks, is what Gearworks is all about. Now, if you want to hear some final thoughts, you can hit that eye in the top right corner screen or follow the show notes in five, four, three, two, one.